Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Kenny, for the introduction. I think Kenny introduced me like that. So I don't feel bad. He gave me a nice introduction, so I don't feel bad when everybody starts leaving the room five minutes from now. So, um, this has uh, been a great couple of days. It's the wrong slide to start, but it's been a great couple of days for me. Um, you know, I, I was invited to come and speak. I contemplated, boy, should I go out a couple days early? Uh, we've got all our kids still back in, in Ann Arbor, and I hate leaving the, the team and the kids um, for, for any length of time. Uh, but I thought, geez, it's also a great opportunity for me. And it certainly has been. So um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, all the guys for putting this together, all the ADM guys, Kenny, everybody at USA Hockey, uh, everybody that did the work administratively, it's been, it's been fabulous. And without question, the coaches that are here. Um, I have been, um, I, I know that everybody here, it seems that everybody was handpicked. It, it appears that everybody was handpicked. This is a pretty neat group of people in here. Uh, I've picked up on that just by the way you carry yourself, by the questions you ask, um, and the faces that are in here. Um, I benefit from everybody, everybody's work that's in here. I benefit tremendously and so do we. Um, the question, one of the questions that uh, was, was talked about last night on the side was, you know, how has the game changed in 10 years? And um, I started coaching, I think, in 94 uh, in the USHL. And it's amazing how much the game's changed in the last five years. But uh, when, when you think of that question, how has it changed, how has it changed, I think one thing that gets lost that now I see significantly. I've worked for a couple different NHL teams based in Canada, a couple other different NHL teams. Now I do the international stuff with our national teams. And uh, what's changed is the American-born player. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I spoke with Gino Cavallini last night for a bit. And uh, when I grew up in Chicago, I was coached by parents. I didn't have a coach that had played hockey until my midget AAA year, one year is all I had a coach that played hockey. And I look across the country now, and, and the kids that we have coming in just firsthand with me, they're so well coached, they're so well prepared for what we're going to throw at them. And we throw an awful lot at them, but their base is strong enough to handle it, and both as an athlete, as a person. Um, and that's, uh, I would be very remiss without um, passing that along because it is a credit to everybody in this room. Um, and we, we are, you know, everybody is looking for changes. There's an awful lot of countries looking to see what we're doing. And um, I, I think it's incredible to see how far we've advanced. And I think there's a lot of fear in people to see where we might be in 10 years. So uh, thanks for, for having me. And um, as you can see uh, on, the, on the topic here, um, we'll talk about the talented player, but we'll talk about the landscape. I want to talk about the landscape. What lays ahead for our most talented players? Um, you know, and that being, uh, the challenge of getting to the NHL. Um, then I'll finish, uh, I'll cover a little bit on what we do at the NTDP and some of my coaching philosophy. philosophy. So this is the slide that should have been up there. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of my background. Um, there's a lot of guys that have a lot more experience certainly playing than I do in here. A lot of, a lot of guys that played in the NHL. Um, I benefited a lot from the family I grew up in. Uh, my dad owned his own business. I got to uh, work and kind of be a fly on the wall there for a lot of years when I was a kid. Uh, I had have an older brother that uh, many guys in this room know. <clears throat> Does anybody want to describe how he was as a player? He was an idiot. <laughs> he was an idiot. This is uh, 15 game suspension here for clubbing uh, Neil Wilkinson over the head. And, I, and I'm sure the guys that, uh, in the room that played against him are laughing at that one too and might want to get him. Um, I was three years younger, so it was me getting clubbed over the head. And I learned a lot of lessons growing up, and I try to bring them to, to coaching. And the first one was when you got a brother three years older than you, compete or it's going to be worse. He wouldn't let you walk away. I know everybody in here that has an older brother knows that. You can't walk away. So that, for me, uh, was a lesson I learned young, and uh, it's, it's the difference maker. Um, use what you have. Don't complain. You know, I, I always had to, oh, I had to think about things. I wasn't going to beat him with size or strength, that's for sure, and maybe not even ability. Um, but I always had to find ways to get better, be smarter, 
That was the third lesson I learned. The fourth lesson I learned was be grateful. Because when I did beat him, if I flaunted it, the beating was worse. So I learned that one too. And uh, the last one is determination gets results. So uh, all of those things tie in um, to, to really uh, what I'm about as a coach and what I've learned through being working with NHL teams and working with American League players that uh, I've really studied them. I've watched, I've looked, I've written down, I, I do postseason reports, I ask myself, why did this guy make it, that guy not make it? Um, why can't I get to this guy as a coach? Um, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, one of the biggest things I learned from, from Tony was probably 10 years ago. And for all the, for all the fighting we did as kids, we, I don't think we could possibly be any closer now. Uh, I rely on him for a lot and, and talk to him a lot. Um, one of the things I asked him a few years ago, I said, Tone, uh, when did you know you were going to play in the NHL? And, he's, and he looks at me, he's, what are you talking about? I knew when I was 12 years old I was going to play in the NHL. And I, and I, I thought, you, that's, that's incredible. All I dreamt of when I was probably 13 and 14, I, said, I told him my problem was all I wanted to do was play at the University of Wisconsin. I said, maybe that was my problem. And it probably in part was. But I see that in the players, the hundreds of players I've had at the American League level. You gotta really want it. You gotta really believe it. You gotta be, your conviction has to be so strong. And I talk to our guys about determination all the time. Determination wins. Um, you have to have, you have to value making it to a higher level than the next guy. And that's usually in the form of sacrifice. You know, one simple little thing when we get guys to the, to the national team program, it's amazing. Um, we, we, we do a lot of educating with them, and I'll get into that. Um, I want them to know how hard the path is going to be. And I want to force them to make choices and realize they are making choices. Uh, one beauty with us is, is the schedule. Our kids get up at 6.30 in the morning or 6.45, and they got to be at school, I'm guessing 6.45, who knows. they got to be at school at 7.30, and their attendance is good. So they get to class at 7.30, they finish school about 1.35, we're, they get to the rink about you know, 5 to 2, we're typically on the ice about 2.30, maybe 2.45, uh, and then they're at the rink till about 6, and they're tired. We grind them. And they're going against kids that can keep up with them, so they're tired. Um, there's not a lot of time. And some simple thing is when they, they add something to their life, such as just a simple thing, a girlfriend. It's amazing the impact it has because we are exhausting them. We're stress inoculating them. So they're using every ounce of energy physically, emotionally, everything. They're away from home, their mom and dad aren't there, they're emotionally drained, they're physically drained. They're challenged by the competition, by us, by their peers, they're pushed. So when they add one thing or their grades start falling in school, everything falls apart. So I've seen it over the years, just a simple thing. It's, it's pretty clear cut, so I, I use this as an example. Uh, plenty of guys have girlfriends. Some guys are chasing girls. And you know, we had one kid that just went through his third girlfriend. Um, and you don't have enough time to add. So, so we do simple things like we have them make a priority list. What are your priorities? Obviously, they're going to put hockey number one. And then we go one step further and say, OK, how much time and emotional energy and focus do you dedicate to hockey? And they'll go 85, 90%, <laughs> okay? I won't argue, just put it down. And uh, then next would be, we, we, we eliminate school and family. So they're not even on there. Uh, next is uh, school, they'll put school down. And I challenge them, I say, no, put, if you play Xbox, put Xbox down. How long do you play Xbox? So they'll put that down, but it'll be 85 to 90% hockey. And then I say, okay, that's your great, that's your priority list. You have 100% of the energy, you have 100% of your attention. Now, you're gonna add something to your life. It's gotta come out of that. So if you had a girlfriend or you had something else, a new hobby, it's coming out of that. You say you got 85% of your, of your attention on hockey, well, it's probably coming out of there. And we use that as a tool to educate. It, yeah, I think it's phenomenal for the kids. It's, it, it develops a self-awareness. We even have them put their priority list after the kids get to know each other, beginning of the second year. I'll have them write their priority list on a big whiteboard, just like this. And then I'll have their teammates grade them. 
say, no, no, no way. You're with your girlfriend all the time. Or you never stop playing Xbox. You can't wait to leave the rink to go play Xbox. You've got it down as 1%. It's all you do. And they call each other out. It's great. It's a great exercise. So uh, we, we do a lot of that stuff. Um, and a lot of this stuff is just thought, thinking back. And, and um, so the landscape, I'll go into the landscape of, of the future for, for our players. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is, is you know, we, we all see talent and we all have the dream uh, as coaches and players, geez, this guy can get to the NHL. Um, so we'll flip to this. This is a draft analysis I did uh, with our assistant coaches. We put this together. So we looked at the, the draft, really. These numbers are from 2000 to 2008 draft, okay? It's not the 9 and 10 draft. Uh, of all the players drafted in those years, and, and I use this for our kids and our parents, God, it's so exciting to be drafted. It's so cool. I'm going to be drafted. Uh, I'm going to play in the NHL. And, and I start the, our orientation with the parents out. And between that year, 2000 and 2008, those players, six, seven drafts ago, they should be in the NHL by now. There's 1,362 players drafted from 2000, 2008 that never played a game in the NHL. 1,362. There's another 193 that played fewer than 10 games. And I, I tell them, you might say you'd be happy playing fewer than 10 games until you play fewer than 10 games, and you're not going to be happy. So add that in there. That's about 1,500, my math's bad, 1,550, 1,550 players, if I'm right, that really never played in the NHL. They were drafted. So everybody gets excited. I re we really see it at the program. It's all about the draft. It's all about the rankings. There's more. I, I joke around with our guys. Uh, I, I wish everybody in here would start a blog and rank players. So our parents would see that there's 40 different rankings instead of three because they, they live and die on the three ranking polls that are out there. It's crazy. And, and we deal with it. Um, but the reality is that. Why is that? So that, that piqued me. We talked about, you know, last night the talk was should the draft go to 19, should it stay down? To me, to a, to a degree, I, I, having worked there and think about it a lot, hey, there's 690 roster spots. There's 30 teams and there's 23 roster spots. That's it. That's fixed. That's a fixed number. It's not changing unless there's expansion. So it doesn't matter what we do with the draft. It doesn't matter how we develop players. We have to develop them better than the next guy. We have to develop our players. When they, when they want to go to the NHL, they have to take a roster spot. They have to be better than somebody. All our evaluations now, especially the parents, it's crazy. It's all within the birth year. When you go to the NHL, there's 18, 19 birth years. 20 birth years, whatever it is. It's incredible. And, and we're, we're getting all excited because we're good in one birth year. That's... There's 690 spots, that's it. Now we'll go to the next slide. I just put this one together last night, so I think I'm right on it, but um, this is Chicago Blackhawks depth right now. I think Versteeg is injured, but I, I use this for our guys, even our parents. Say, okay, you wanna go to the NHL? Whose job are you gonna take? Whose job are you gonna take when you go to training camp? And I let them look at that for a little bit. And then the next slide. That's how many years the guys have been in the NHL. So there hasn't been a roster spot open. There's been one less roster spot for 17 years. Because Marion Hose has had it for 17 years. Kane's had it for eight years, and he's not going away. He's probably got another 10. So you're not bumping him out. Richards has been there 14 years. Tay's eight. Sod's three. So you look at this roster, 13 years, 14 years, eight years for DRNA, played in the East Coast League, grinded it out, finally made it up. 10 for Versteeg, 10 for Cursillo, 10 already for Crawford of Pro Hockey, five for Darling, 12, 10, 17 all over here for the defenseman. So I talk to our guys all the time. Guys, you might think you're great. How in the heck are you gonna go into training camp? You gotta go into training camp and take one of those spots. And you think you're a skilled player. So what would it be like conceivably to go into training camp with the Chicago Blackhawks, tap Joel Quinville on the 
shoulder and say, hey, put me on the power play. I'm really good at the half wall. Probably not going to work out too well for you, obviously. Um, so when you look at those, and, and, and again, this is part of what we try to do to educate the players, how hard it's going to be, how challenging it's going to be, what's the landscape for you moving forward. Uh, the next slide is just a little bit about it, and, and I'm probably going over stuff that everybody in this room knows, but, um, but I'm going to uh, do, do it anyway and talk about just some of my experience with it. And, you know, most roster spots are, uh, I, I look at it this way, the question, how many go-to players can you have? And I, and I ask that to myself, like, how many go-to players? I've got a national team, and I've got four lines, and I want to get four lines going. I really don't want to have a hierarchy. I don't want to have a fourth line, especially at the age we're coaching. But what happens when you get in a pinch, your top, you, you can really have two lines of go-to guys. <laughs> one's resting, and the other one's on the ice. And when the other one's too tired to come off, you're going back with the go, that go-to line. So basically, you got your top two lines, your power play guys, if we look on the right here, those are your top six forwards. These guys, the coaches typically allow these guys to take some risk. And this is an old slide, um, obviously. Um, but these guys are afforded risks. My best players are, you know, are, are the guys most, most likely to score. You know, in this case, Crosby. If he goes out on the ice and he gives up a goal and the Penguins are down a goal, the coach isn't going to turn around and go to Craig Adams and say, boy, Crosby just screwed up. We need a goal. Get out there, Craig. It's not happening. Crosby's going back out there. Malkin's going back out there. Craig Adams goes out there and he screws up, gives up the goal. He's, not only is he not going back out there, he might be going down the other way. So it's important for the players to kind of understand how they're going to be evaluated, how they're going to be looked at. Bottom six forwards, typically penalty killers, shot blockers, checking rolls. You know, they might be out there to protect the lead, but they must be reliable. Must be reliable. Have to be. We know that. So when I challenge our players, I said, you know, we, we have all skilled players. Everybody in this room deals with the skilled players, the high-end talent. So I talk to our high-end talent guys and I say, hey guys, if you go to training camp with the Hawks or with the Penguins, how are you going to be put on the power play? Is Joel Quinville going to gra grab Patrick Kane and say, hey Patrick, got this great new superstar. You don't mind sitting, do you? That's not going to happen. So I try to convince our guys that don't try out and prepare yourself to try out for three spots if you're a forward. And it was this, this I learned real fast running East Coast League teams as a coach and GM. You only have so much money to spend. So I tell kids all the time, hey, you want $600 to come for a week. If you'll sign with $300 and you come to tryout, you'll be trying out for 12 spots because all 12 make over $300. If you want to try out for a $600 spot, I can only afford to pay two guys $600. Now you're trying out for two spots. It's your choice. You got to earn one of two spots. If you learn how to play the game, and you go to training camp, you'll be trying out for 12 spots. So players, I really work on players and sell to them, pay attention to the details. Learn the details. Because when you get your opportunity here, most top six players that aren't high first round picks started right here in the bottom. And to get in the bottom, you got to be reliable or you don't play. You go learn in the minors. So uh, I work, I use that a lot to sell our guys. And, and, and over time, you get buy-in. They, they figure it out. They start seeing it um, and start, start internalizing it. Now back to role players. There are situations, too. And again, I tell our guys all the time, ice time is responsibility. And if you want more time, be more responsible. Because that's all our decisions are based on that as a coach. We want to know what we're putting on the ice and we don't want to be scored on. Be reliable, we'll, put, we'll use you more. Ice time is responsibility. Be responsible, be reliable, you're out there. So they're slotting, obviously Alex Ovechkin at 9.5 million down here was slotted higher than Jay Beagle who was making 900,000. This is a slide from a few years ago. I think Dale Hunter was coaching Ovechkin. This was a playoff game, game two versus the Rangers. Ovechkin was not hurt. 
His ice time down here was 13 minutes and 36 seconds. Jay Beagle's ice time was 20 minutes and 10 seconds in that game. So Alex Ovechkin sat on the bench and watched Jay Beagle play for seven more minutes or thereabout. Why? Because Jay Beagle fit the situation. So again, you want more ice time? Recognize the situation. We're up two to one. They were probably up two to one. I should have that on there. But uh, I don't, uh, my apologies. But they were clearly up in this game. They didn't need Ovechkin. And we don't need another goal. And Ovi's probably a little bit of a liability. We might give one up. Sure, we might go up three to one. But we also might be two to two. Maybe Jay Beagle gives us a little insurance. He's not going to score. But we're not going to get scored on. So if you want to play in more situations, figure out how to play in more situations. I, I always challenge our players. Make me play you. Learn to make me play you. And you know some of the things we talked about is our ways to do that. Um, one of my jobs as an American League coach with uh, the couple teams that I worked with was to coach the prospects in Traverse City. I think I was there seven years running you know the, the, the rookie teams for the NHL team. And those are, those are interesting environments because you've got all the rookies that were just drafted. So Detroit hosts the event. So you've got Detroit rookies against St. Louis rookies against Columbus rookies. And I've never seen scouts so nervous. You know, usually they'll come in and you know, have a cup of coffee and relax. These guys were nervous because it's their prospects, that guys that they just argued for, for two years against Detroit's prospects. And it was interesting dynamic. Um, and one time we had a discussion, uh, I was working for Larry Plow, and Larry, fabulous guy to work for. And uh, he loved it. He, he was as relaxed as could be, and he loved the banter. And so we would coach the game. We'd go back to the hotel, and we'd have a full staff meeting. And all we'd go over was the players. And it got to one player in the room, a Russian player, high pick, world junior player for them, stud, stud player. I benched him. And I put him out power play. He was with Peter Sena, Hobie Baker winner. So he had good, good line mates, another Russian kid. And uh, first power play, 50 seconds. I mean, it's 50 seconds. Whistle blows. You change. So I change. He kicks the bench and bangs the stick. And I'm thinking, did I miss something? Did something just happen out there? Or is he pissed at me for taking him off the ice at 50 seconds? Another power play about five minutes later. Same exact thing. Bangs the bench. Sits down right away. Kicks the bench. And I'm like, this little son of a... So... That's it. I took him off Sana's line. He's playing second line. I don't think I use him on the power play the rest of that game. So we get in that meeting afterwards, and the scouts were in the stands, and the, all the scouts were, they were irate. They were irate. It came up. We went player to player, and then it came to this kid. And uh, Larry says, okay, anybody want to talk to him? And, yeah, yeah. This guy's a world-class player. I don't know how we can't have him playing with other world-class players. He's not even on the power play. I don't know what we're doing. And I'm sitting at the other end of the table, and Larry's awesome guy. He goes, anybody have any follow-ups? Donnie? And I said, sure. So we got into an argument. And my argument was that he was a world-class talent, but he was a long way from being a world-class player. And there's a major difference. He had all this talent that he didn't know how to use, and he was a spoiled brat. So for, for me, that was a lesson for me. I didn't really know what was going on. But as we got in arguments and staff, and, and I'm absorbing you know, opinions from everybody else, and, and we're discussing it, really that's what it came down to. I saw the game completely different because I want performance. And leads me to this slide. You know, talent, and this is our challenge as, as coaches with these 16-year-old kids. You know, talent is seductive. Scouts and agents love it. It's potential. Love the potential, very seductive. You got a great future. Come to our program. It's better. You'll be a first line guy with us. Your team doesn't appreciate you. Not like we would appreciate you. We deal with it at the national team program. We have to re recruit our players so they don't go to the OHL or CHL. We literally have to sell them on coming back to the national team program. It's just the way it is because everybody, scouts, agents, very seductive to have talent. The other side, okay, that's talent. 
And the other side that I figured out is effectiveness. That's all we want as coaches, as GMs. We want results. We want to see that that guy's contributing. That's how we're rating them. We don't get, I don't get too excited about this. This doesn't excite me at all, actually. That's what wins hockey games over there. So for me, that's exciting. So that's just something else to challenge your players with and talk to them about. Um, I'm going to just throw this one up here for a second. That's obviously 443 players. Some duplicates because I had guys. It's basically all the seasons I coached to pro hockey at the minor league level. Um, and those are the players listed. And so what I did is I actually I looked at those players and I said, why, why is this guy up in the NHL? And the other guy next to him was a first round pick or we signed him for a million dollars and he's not. And when I looked through all those players, I highlighted the ones that were in the NHL, highlighted different color guys that were 10 games, highlighted a different color guys that were high, had high status coming in. They were first round picks or we signed him for boatload of money. Hobie Baker winners. I think there's six Hobie Baker winners in the mix there. And so I looked at that and I said, okay, why? Why are these highlighted guys in the NHL? What did they have that the other guys didn't have? And it was fascinating for me to go through that. And basically, it works like this. I don't, I don't have the middle. I don't have time to go through the middle here. Maybe uh, if there's an interest, I could go through that next time if I'm invited back. But um, basically, the base of any player is their skill level. But they've got to be in shape. So that's your base. It's always increasing or decreasing. Immediately it's decreasing. You don't have a good summer and you don't work out, that base is decreasing. You got to be in shape. Physically, mentally, you have to be in shape or you have no chance of, of maximizing your potential. So you're a really talented pet player, you got a great base. The biggest challenge for players ahead is opportunity. At your level, at my level, we give them opportunity. Mom and dad pay, or we promise, but we give them opportunity. Where these players are going, it's not given. You gotta earn opportunity, and when you get it, you gotta make do on it. And so for every guy in here that played in the NHL, to me, that's an amazing accomplishment. I have a lot of respect for that fact because you got to make good on your opportunity and you got to be ready when somebody gives you it because it's going to be given to you or taken from you. You don't have it anymore. Mom and dad don't pay for it. So that's a real challenge. So again, when you got that opportunity, just because you're playing in the NHL doesn't mean you're staying in the NHL. You got to contribute. You got to be an effective player because that's how the coach and the GM are grading you. And You'll get an opportunity if you got a high base skill. If you're the first pick overall, the second pick overall, you probably don't have to go to the minors to learn what's in the middle of that pyramid. Your base skill will allow you an apprenticeship in the NHL. Here's Tyler Sagan. I was scouting for the Canucks, doing pro scouting the year they they beat us in the cup final, and uh, one of my jobs was for Elaine Vigneault to just do the pre-scout the last couple months of the season. So it was awesome as a coach. That's all I did, watch NHL teams. Who might we play in the playoffs? So when I got to the Bruins, um, I loved watching this. This is the ice time. This is in order of ice time, Tyler Sagan's rookie year, when he had an apprenticeship because he had a base talent that would allow him and GM to say, hey, we're going to give you an opportunity, Tyler. The coach... The coach says you can't play in the NHL right now. You're not responsible enough. And there's, there's a host of other things. But the coach says you can't play in the NHL because you're 25th on this team in ice time per game. 25th. The GM says, and when I read this, the GM says, we're not sending him down. It's our first pick. Second pick overall. He can learn here. We need to teach him here in the NHL. But clearly... He wasn't a responsible player yet. He wasn't a contributing men or, uh, member of the Boston Bruins. Sure, he popped in here and there, but he wasn't a contributor. So he was lucky enough to get an opportunity granted to him 
to learn at the NHL level. Most of the guys we coach won't have that opportunity. And we can't let them take that for granted. I don't let our guys take that for granted. Um, so just to conclude on that, to stay in the NHL, uh, you got to take somebody else's job, which we saw, um, which I demonstrated on that first couple screens. You've got to be given an opportunity. And that's really hard. I talk to our kids a lot because what I saw in the American League was how many players go to bed tonight that are 17 years old and say, God, I'm, I can't wait to play in the American League. This will be awesome. I get to play in the American Hockey League. None of them. I mean, everybody from the time they're drafted or 16 is saying, you're going to play in the NHL. God, it's going to be great watching. You got drafted by the Bruins. You got drafted by the Blackhawks. How, how come you're in the American Hockey League? How come you're in the AHL? And I've seen it numerous times because I've had conversations with my players. Over and over. You're the Hobie Baker winner. And you're sitting in my office and you got two line mates that are on your team that are playing. One's for playing for the Edmonton Oilers. Just played his first game. And there's another guy that's a year ahead of you but had half the points you had in college. And he's playing for the Buffalo Sabres. And you're sitting in the American League because you were drafted by a team. You're a right winger, and they really don't need right wingers right now. How does that player feel? Terrible. It's a blow to his self-image. It's a blow to his self-esteem. Worse yet, he's got to answer questions. How come, how come you're in the American League and the guy you were better than in college or the 10 guys you were better than in college are all up in the NHL? So it's a challenge. So again, that opportunity is not going to be given. It's amazing how hard it's going to be for players if they got to go to the American League. You got to be ready to seize that, as we talked about. Uh, just, you know, not to get too off track, but seize an opportunity. Hey, you got to know what Mike Babcock wants. You got to know his system. You got to know the game plan. Last night you played Columbus. Tonight you play Boston. Two totally different teams. You're not gonna, you're not gonna enter the zone as easy. You might have to do something differently through neutral ice on, a, on an offensive zone. You got to know the game plan, and you got to know your identity as a player. How are, how are you going to execute Mike Babcock's system, execute the game plan laid out tonight, and impose your identity on the game? Be big and strong if you're big and strong. Be fast if you're fast. Okay? And that takes a lot of maturity, believe it or not, to get there. So for the kids, now we'll move a little bit toward our, toward our program. The kids that I coach, this is one month after they left Ann Arbor. So this will be my kids one month from now, or a month from the from the beginning of June when they left. Three kids I had in the last birth year drafted by the Blackhawks. Bam, they're in Blackhawk rookie camp wearing jerseys right on their website. So, so when I got them in to the U-17s, they were coming from youth hockey. One month after they left the U-18s, they're going into NHL camps with men. One month after. So that's with the Hawks. This down here is Mike McCarron, drafted in the first round. Same thing, same birth year, 95. This is all the 95 birth year. Bam, that's a week or two weeks after. So the pressure on this kid, I mean, when he called me, he said, I shut my Twitter account off. Well, why'd you do that, Mac? You love Twitter. I'm getting ripped, completely ripped. They hate me in Montreal. I'm the worst draft pick, I'm slow. I'm ugly, you name it, I'm getting tweeted it. <laughs> Shut it off. One month after, he's got that pressure. The poor kid didn't know what to do. His world was, you know, hey, Twitter's great, this is awesome. Coach, I walked out of the hotel, I'm signing autographs, I'm getting pictures taken of me. And a month later, everyone telling me he sucks. Welcome to the world. And this was Buffalo, this is another one of our players. We had three in Buffalo's camp as well, one month later. So it changes fast for these kids, and we're doing the best we can to prepare them. Um, biggest thing I talk about, and I talk with the parents too, to educate them again, to educate them. What's your source of confidence? And I touched on a little bit with uh, one of the players I talked, touched on last night about making the World Junior Team. When they come to me, I want them to realize they really don't have a lot of substance behind their confidence. They're confident, why? because you're beating guys that will never play in the NHL. That's your confidence. You're scoring f three goals a game. Well, guess what? You're not going against Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook. 
And that little toe drag you do, if you beat him once, you'll never beat him again. You will never beat that NHL defenseman a second time. Maybe you will, but I tell him you'll never beat him again. So basically, I try to get convinced them that, hey, you're confident. I'm not going to take it away from you. But you haven't done it against good players yet. It doesn't mean anything. I diminish the fact that they come in with 100 points. It doesn't mean anything. Can't carry those points with you. So this next slide I like, I show it to our parents. So what we do, what we try to do, is they come in as Superman and we're throwing kryptonite at them and seeing how they react to it. And it's, we, we do that in many, many ways. Um, our coaching approach, first thing I want to do, it goes with that confidence thing. I want to establish a mindset. Uh, Dr. Lauer touched a little bit on it yesterday. Um, but, and I touched on it at the start when I asked Tony, when did you know you were going to play in the NHL? That conviction that he had. And his mindset, now that I know in hindsight, I've studied enough and read enough and looked at it enough, his mindset was outstanding because he didn't think he was better than anybody. He wanted it more than anybody. And when you think you're better than somebody because you're good in your birth year, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So really work on establishing the mindset really skill focus skill 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 and you know the question is it winning or developing i honestly can't even imagine winning without developing i, I just can't imagine it you got to get the most out of your player every day and you got to get them better every day you can get as mad at them as you want but you got to be better tomorrow this is how you were yesterday no problem this is what you got to focus on today you keep getting yourself better your team better you keep developing skill you're going to win. I watched uh, from the, the lockout in 05, 06, 07, 08. Uh, Carolina was the first team to win. Forget it. It was Anaheim. It was uh, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Chicago, LA. And I looked at it, Boston. You know, every team there was overlap of their system, but every team ran a different system. Every team had different, every coach had different points of emphasis. So it wasn't their system that was superior. Mike Babcock won in 2008, lost in 2009 to the Penguins, and then hasn't been in the Stanley Cup final since. It wasn't Mike Babcock's system. It was the skill. You make your players better, whatever system you want to run, I guarantee they'll run that system better. So, I, like I mentioned last night, I work very little on systems. I do it more on video. Uh, educate. You know, it's a lot what I just talked about. Just create an awareness. And then challenge, push, squeeze, pull constantly. You stop demanding of your player, they're backing off. There is no question they're backing off. Not a doubt. They need to be pushed. They've never been there. They don't know it. They've got it. Any way you can push them, push them. And then adjust as a coach. You've got to read and react. And you've got to measure correctly. You know, I never measure winning. We lost. You're terrible. Can't accept losing. No. We didn't work hard. We didn't focus on what we were supposed to focus on. We weren't committed. I'll nail those guys for that, but not for losing. Winning's going to happen if we do the right things. Um, so, again, I'll, I'll probably get in touch in measuring, but you've got to measure things correctly. You know, you can't... You can't measure a guy if it's his first game and he's out of shape and whatever, like it should be mid-season. It's not mid-season for him. So don't overreact. Uh, and then read and react. I mean, for, for me, I challenge my coaches. We have a great coaching staff. I'm pretty fortunate. I love them. And, and uh, we have open round table every morning. And, and I want them to tell me what I'm not doing, what I need to do better every day. And, and I demand it. You tell me, how, did that drill suck? Tell me it sucked. I want to know. What didn't you like about it? Did I present it wrong? Should we have done video before practice just on that concept? What? And they're great. They give me great feedback. And read and react, it's just something simple like that. And, and you got to read and react in everything. Stay in the moment, get in the moment. So for me, I'll always put a couple extra drills on the practice sheet 
and I'll look, I mean, our kids, like I told you the schedule, they, they're up at 6.30 in the morning. Who knows if they went to bed before 11. So sometimes you get to the rink, they're exhausted. And I got this practice plan out, and it's, hey, this is great. This is a great practice plan. I'm a fool if I think it's a great practice plan <laughs> until I see the players. They'll tell me whether it's a great practice plan. Are they engaged? Are they moving? Are they focused? If they're not, you know what I do right then? Put them in the benches and go four on four. I don't get mad at them because that's not going to be productive. We're on the ice. I want them moving. So some of the times the assistants will go by and the drill will be botched or something. And, and uh, well, looks like it's time for four on four. Yep, it's time for four on four. And the kids right away, bam, they're into it. They're engaged. Four on four, let's go. I'm out, I'm out. And bam, they're in it. We do that for five, six minutes. It's amazing. We go back to practice. We're, we pick it up like it's, they're awake. They're back awake. So just a lot of little things like that that you learn. I always post practice so the guys know before they get on the ice what to expect. I think that works great. Uh, something I've learned. Um, obviously, I benefited from being around Tony. I, I, I got to know Mike. We were both uh, rookie coaches in the American League and got to know him then. So... I actually talked to Mike uh, fairly often, and I had one of his kids play for us with the 95s. Um, I was down at the uh, one of the games this year in morning practice, and I, I had Austin Matthews with me, one of our players, um, who was on the World Junior team and actually played a game for the men's team. Um, he'll be the first pick in the draft next year. There's nobody close to him. Um, so we've got a, an unbelievable American-born talent in Austin Matthews. But... Mike came to one of our games against the University of Michigan. And he knew Austin, because Tony's in his ear all the time about how, how good American-born players are, and he's back about Canadians and back and forth. So anybody that knows Mike knows he, he, he likes to compliment, but he doesn't. And, he's, and he's, he's a coach. He's a great coach. Great coach. So we're in the coach's room, and he's got a towel over his shoulder, and, and uh, it's Austin standing there with me and, and uh, Tony, and I said, Mike, this is Austin Matthews, and shakes his hand. He goes, yeah, I know who you are. And he lays that quote on him. And he says, yeah, I've seen you play, kid. you got a good thing going. You're a hell of a player, but just remember, the day your talent exceeds your work ethic is the day you run yourself out of this business. And he walked away. It was great. It was perfect. He, he, he didn't really want to talk to him because he was an American. I, I, I guarantee it. He didn't want to talk to him. <laughs> but he, got, he, had, he was in the hallway, and it's this, this short, and he knew who Austin was, and he had to say something. And that's what he threw at him. So, great quote. Um, this is a great book. Fixed Mindset and Growth Mindset. So, basically, if you haven't read this, uh, and I, I made it mandatory for our parents that are coming in this year to read it. Well, I don't know if it's mandatory, but I suggested it. Uh, the, basically, the fixed mindset is I win because I'm more talented than you. That's why I win. I'm superior. I'm a superior athlete. And if I have to work to beat you, I'm not a superior athlete. So it becomes negative self-image then if you've got to work. And then the growth mindset is, hey, if I work, I'm going to get better. If I outwork you, I'm going to get better than you. Uh, you continue to work. You get positive. So this book here is is I just flipped this down last night, so there's probably way better quotes to pull out of there or, or ways to, to paraphrase it, but it's an outstanding book. And um, I think the best teams operate under that mentality. Uh, one of our biggest challenges at the program, I've, I've come up with this kind of term, is the destiny theory. You know, we get, we get a kid and there's all nervous parents, and we run our trial camp in March, and, and there's 200 scouts in there. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm overestimating. I, there, there's got to be close to 200 scouts between junior and college and pro, and it's crazy. So for all these kids coming from small markets, and all of a sudden they come to our national team trial camp, and they walk in the building. They might have seen 5 or 10 or 20 scouts, but now there's 200. And then when we select them, they're on the national team, that elevates their status, obviously. You've just picked 22 players. You're the national governing body. These must be the best 22 players. It's, it's a frenzy. These kids can't stop. So I, I talk about the destiny theory with our coaches. 
where now as coaches, and you guys live it too, so I'm not telling you anything you guys don't live. In the parents' mindset, they don't even know it, but we battle it as coaches. They believe, oh my God, he's going to be in the NHL. He's going to be in the NHL. The only thing you can do is screw it up, coach. It's the only thing you can do because he's on the path. Now it can get screwed up. And it's reinforced by everybody telling them how good they are. Professional people telling them how good they are. So I, I use the term destiny theory. It's, it's, it's amazing. You know, uh, a lot of kids in our program that have a great first year, 17 year, they struggle the second year. I just looked back and looked at it. And there's a lot of kids that struggled the first year that have a great second year. Jack Roslovic had was minus 28 last year. He was in tears in my office. You know what I showed him? That Steven Santini was minus 28 his first year and was picked 33rd, it was New Jersey Devils' first pick. 33rd overall or 35th overall. And he's going to play in the NHL probably for a long time. I said, Jack, he was minus 28 just like you his first year. Have I ever got mad at you for being minus 28? No, but I'm embarrassed. Well, don't be. Don't be embarrassed. So this year, he was on fire. Struggled the first 15 games. He had 70 points in the last 45 games or something. Insane. And he's in the top 10 of all time in assists in our program for a single season. So it's, it's amazing though when I reflect back on it, I looked. Can kids handle that early success? So, um, and I always, th this always happens with us. You know, I have great speakers come in. I had Danny Marr, Central Scouting, speak to our parents this year. I showed slides of Ryan Kessler scoring seven goals his first year in the program. Other guys scoring five goals their first year in the program. I said, hey, parents, your kids are going to struggle. They, you, you brought up, you know, Uncle Bob and Aunt Shannon and cousins to the game, and they scored three goals, and everybody was proud. Ha, I'm proud. He scored three goals. I knew it. They might come to us and score three goals in a month. They might not score in a month. So when they walk out in this lobby and their pride was on, their self-esteem went on three goals and I haven't scored in 10 games, how are they going to feel? Because you expect them to score. We're putting them at a level where they're probably not going to, to challenge them, bring them out of their comfort zone. They're fine with it. Oh, that's great, coach. Really, that was a great talk. I get it. You know when they stop getting it is when their teammate has 15 points and they have eight points. Well, I'm okay if everybody has eight points, but not that his teammate has 15 points because you're, you're playing the teammate more than you're playing my son and you got better line mates. That's why there's a seven point discrepancy and it only gets bigger. So as the scoring spreads out for me, your challenges become bigger as a coach. Okay. Our job is coaching and education, same thing, progress, confidence, self-image. Um, and we work on those a lot. Uh, this struck me, and, and Tommy, I, I think I'm right on this from your speech the other day. 20 players you selected for U16s? Are you in here? No, U16 is 40. 40, okay. And only three out of the 40 then made to the U20 team on average? Three to five. Three to five on average out of the 40 you picked at 16. So to me, the first thing I thought of right there was they're too young to handle the success of it. Geez, I've arrived. I'm on the U16 national team. They forget to work. I'm here because I'm great, and I'm going to be there because I'm great. They don't associate that they're there because they worked, or maybe they're there because they're great, but they're not going to be with the U20 unless they learn how to work and compete. So there's a connect. We, we go at that quite a bit. I look at, uh, I'm going to give you a quick coaching opportunity here that give you a little bit on how we coach. So, so the first clip here, ooh, do I have that right? OK, I do. I'm sorry. Let's try that again. First clip here is going to be a, uh, a turnover by our player. Right here, he goes between his legs. Now, we're at BU, Boston University. It's a one goal game right now, I, I believe. And there's two minutes and 20 seconds left. And he goes between his legs in the neutral zone. Ah, shoot.
So he goes between his legs and you saw the hooking penalty he took, right? Okay, now we're going to show you the next clip. Same game, earlier in the game. Different player. So he loses the puck here. Now watch this guy skate. Stops in the slot, stays in front of the net. That's a forward. So he lost the puck. Stopped blue snow and never broke stride until he got all the way to our D zone, top of the crease, and then he stopped, and that's a centerman. The other guy tried to dangle and neutralize behind the back between the legs with two minutes left in the game. Turns it over, turns around, and hooks Eichel for a lazy penalty. Great teaching moment for, for me as a coach. I didn't get mad at the guy going between his legs trying to do something fancy and neutralize. I didn't get mad at him at all for that. I got mad at him for turning around and taking a lazy penalty. And there's a big difference. If we want skill and we want guys to develop, I can't get mad at him for trying that. I can get mad at him for not recovering for it every day of the week. And so a great teaching moment there to show Austin Matthews was, it was the player there that stopped Blue Snow when he lost the puck and sprinted all the way back. That's why he's a special athlete. Because he cares. I don't even know if he knew he was back checking. He was pissed he lost the puck. Somebody took it from him. Pissed. I swear I don't think he knew he was back checking. He was just pissed. And the other guy felt victim. Oh, geez. Big difference in a coaching opportunity. So what we do is we praise work ethic. We associate work ethic with results every chance we get. That's just an objective, okay? Um, treat them like a pro. Say to the guys right away, hey, you want to be treated like a 16-year-old? You want to be a 16-year-old or you want to be a pro? Which one? So I'm hard on you? Well, you want me, you want me to treat you like a 16-year-old now? Or do you want to be a pro? So we are hard on them. I grind them. Huge focus on skill development. There's 350 goal scorers. They all shoot different. They all skate different. They all play different. I don't try to take a guy and change them. Take your guys and enhance them. Sometimes it drives me crazy when they go to skill coaches, skating coaches, because they all want to say, oh, I'll change something for you. And it's almost like change it to just get credit for, hey, I added that to his game, or I added that to his game. Hey, take those players. Those three guys are passionate. That's why they're good. Create the passion. We want that passion. So I don't really want to change guys as much as I want to enhance them. Just to show you our results in our birth year, this is the... This is single season all time. There's Patrick Kane, there's Phil Kessel. So it's 18 years at the national team program. Austin Matthews this year, 117 points to Kane's 102. Same number of games. Austin might have had one more game played. He broke the record in five fewer games. Matthew Kachuk this year, 96 points. Jeremy Bracco this year on a different line, 94 points. Clayton Keller, 82 points. So we had four kids this year uh, in the top 10 in points history of the program, and assists in the history of the program, the top 10 all time, six of them. Six of them came from our group. And I tell our kids, hey, I'd rather lose a game 6-5 than win it 2-1. I tell them that. Now, I don't tell them that it's true, or it's not true, I should say, because I would. I'd rather win 2-1 to one than lose 6-5. to five. But I tell them. Because I don't want them tight. I want them going. Go, 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 go. Because I've been on the other side of coaching, and a lot of game planning when you coach is out of fear. A lot of pregame videos out of fear. Hey, watch this, watch that. Don't, don't let this guy, don't do that, don't do that. That's great. I want other teams to pre-scout us and be worried about us. And they're not going to be worried about us if we play defense the whole game. Oh my God, guys, you've got to be worried about this team. They're, they're great. They're defense. They're, they're defensive. They average 14 shots a game. Who's going to be scared of that? Seriously. So I want guys to fear us. And for sure, scoring does that. We averaged over five goals a game this year. And that's with, I don't know how many Division I games we played, but there was a lot in there. This is our tryout camp from two years ago. And I'll let it run. And I want you to watch number 12 in blue. I think he's right here. Just, oops. So watch 12 in blue. Yeah, right here, stride. Not much of a stride. Really doesn't know how to 
position himself to get a puck. Moves it, but he moves it for no reason. There's nothing productive there. He's back off the screen here. There he is right here. Still, he has no position to get a puck. His back's to the play, spinning. Still no position to get a puck. He's a great player, but he doesn't know how to get a puck. Doesn't know where to go on the ice, doesn't know how to support, doesn't know how to read, doesn't know how to react. That's Austin Matthews. That kid's going to be the number one pick overall. And that was just before we got him. And then I'll run a, a, a video of what we want to see. So this is our team. It's primarily against Division I games. Austin's 19. I think I'll show a couple goals of his. But this is what we want to see as a coach. So this is him as 19 a year and two years later. And the difference is remarkable. And I'll let this run. That's him. He's going on Riley here. And Riley's on the men's team overseas right now. And he just blew right by him. Nice sauce pass, area pass. This is a game against Sweden. He's going to walk through three guys here. Great zone entry play by Roslovic. And tucks it five hole. And another great goal. Stuff that uh, the LA guys were talking about. Wall play. Boxing out. He banks it off the back of the net. Around the guy. In. And then this is Boston University. Again, wall play, Eichel's on him, chips it behind. Kachuk back out front. He's out of the air, taps it in. Knows where to go, knows where to get the puck. Big and strong wall play again against Michigan. Stays on it. Attacks the net. Bam, back of the net. And then this is Wisconsin. Now, I put this on here because for me, Well, first of all, my other computer crashed last night, so you're watching some lousy video. I didn't really want this video, but um, we're down in the game. one nothing. 16 minutes left in the third period. We, we should never have been down in this game. Not a chance. I mean, the scoring chances were lopsided. We were controlling this game. My alma mater, yeah, I'd love to win there. But I don't want the guys to know I'm nervous. I don't want the guys to know, oh, God, this game means it. No, I need the guys to focus on them. Be in their element, stay in their element. So the title up there, what I want to see, some grace under pressure for them. They, they never thought they were going to lose this game. Never. And you'll see how poised they are when we take this goal and the way we score these goals. You can see the confidence that they played with in this game. And that's, that's what we want as an objective. So beautiful passing play there. Nice screen in front. So teamwork there. Carry it up. We use a lot of different terms. Identify, use, use people, stay in front, stay on the puck, confident with the puck, possess it, possess it, look, get in the pocket, bam, three to one. And the game ended four to one. But we didn't get rewarded till late in the game. Here's a passing sequence of support against the Division I team. So you can see, you know, we challenge our guys right there. When the guys come to the program, I don't know if this video, I can't pause it or anything because I'll screw it up. But they just went right through five Michigan players. Just walked right through them. Only two of our guys touched the puck, I think, on that. Or, or maybe three, after, two after the... But one huge thing, when the kids come to the program, they're super skilled, but they don't use other players. So when we go up the rink and down the rink, I want them using other players. I want them finding out their teammate and using their teammate. And, and we do a ton of teaching how to use your teammates and beat guys, you know, as, as a pair. So I'll just run this through and uh, ask Kenny how much time I have and finish up. This is just a quick transition. So these are Division One. This is the Gophers. Another game we won. But you can see the confidence that the kids play with. Stay on it, stay on it, great support, great net front presence. Good support, this is a defenseman carrying it up. So he's not, he's looking for his teammates the whole way. Boom, found him, back of the net. Back to Boston University, looking for his teammates, looking for his teammates. There he is, grabbing depth in the zone, spreading the zone, 
give and go, back of the net, right through four Boston University players. Tracking, back of the net. Identifying right away, boom, overload, support. Another clip where they're just coming up the rink looking for teammates. Use other people. Which you'll have to do to play in the NHL. And the confidence that they have, that's against Providence who won the national championship. We tied them 3-3. So I, I run that just to give you an idea of what we want to see is this type of poise and this type of confidence. It took us a long time. Believe me, I panicked my first year at the thought of playing Division I teams with high school kids. We have six sophomore or juniors in high school and we're going to play Michigan and Minnesota. And that pass right there was by our 13th forward, had the poise to make that pass. So to me, I get excited about that. When our 13th forward has the poise to hold a slap shot and wait for the guy to get open and the confidence to do it, I love it. I love it. So um, this was a, uh, a goal. I'll, I'll let it play and finish up here. Kenny, how are we doing? Good on time? Fine. How's everybody doing? Should I? So this, this is going, this is a minute and 15 seconds. We've had possession of the puck. The referee's had his arm up. And he'll have his arm up for a minute and 15 seconds. This is against a USHL team. But you can see our kids' support, confidence, heads up. So six on five with a delayed penalty. Nice play there. Nobody rattled. Everybody's supporting. Still on it. Referee's got his arms gotta be getting tired. <laughs> I'll show you one more on that, and it'll be the end of the video. This is against Minnesota. Division one team, pretty, pretty similar. I think this is 35 seconds. But on a delayed penalty. Again, wall play, identifying players, getting the seams, supporting each other. I think Minnesota was ranked fourth in the nation when we played them this game. Net front presence. So this, this guy's got his arm up. He's got his arm up for... That's again our 13th forward right there, making that play. And our fourth line right wing has been out there the whole shift. And point blank shot. Finally a point blank shot. So that's what we want. We wanted to get a scoring chance the whole time. But there wasn't one there to be had. And our guys had enough confidence and poise. So that is a goal for us as a coach. And some of the things I talked about, we'd never get there with that, with that as a goal. So uh, to me, you know, I just touched on it already, less, less teaching, keep moving. This generation, I, I think about it this way, this generation hasn't played out on the pond. They don't go out and play outdoor hockey. So with that, I think, geez, get them, when you're on the ice, get them moving. Every drill I have, I want them moving. Everything's almost a conditioning drill. You know, one thing I learned in pro hockey, and I learned it fast with your staff and with your player. You got to know what you stand for. You got to be very detailed and very organized. You got to get that detail and organization to the staff so they know what's going on. 
And you've got to be convicted in what you do, but it's got to be a great, simple message to the players. You don't do that, you don't have a chance. The two, two most dysfunctional teams I had taught me how to be a coach. Taught me how to be a coach. One was in the American League, one was in the East Coast League. The best years of hockey. People say, hey, that, that must have been miserable. No, well, no, it was a bit, but it was the best year for me, dealing with that. And to me, you got to keep the players moving. I know in the American League, when I, when I go coach pro, or if I'm an American League coach, I know that if I have those players on the ice for more than 40, I got 45 minutes to work with them. If there's a clock in the building and we get on the ice at 10, and that clock, it's just like you guys right now. Speakers only have 50 minutes. You're looking at me like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. It's been gone over, we're gone over the time. When you're running a practice and there's a clock up above your head and that thing hits 1046, God forbid it hits 11, you've been on the ice for one hour, you're, you're, you might have your players in front of you, you know what's going through their head? This guy doesn't know how to coach. <laughs> Seriously, we're out here an hour. Does he know we're pro players? So it taught me how to be efficient in practice. And our practices are high tempo. Like they're going. Now I, I, don't, I can go more than 45 minutes with our kids. Our kids will kill the ice in about 40 minutes. We usually do 40 minutes and then 40 minutes. And if they're tired and it's useless, like I said, I adjust right away. But um, the more skill, the better, the faster, the better. The pace is, is huge for me. Um, some of this I went over. I'll see if I didn't do anything. I'll finish with just some stuff that I get feedback from the players. Okay, this is a, this is a survey. I give to the kids and I said okay when you're coming into the program I have the kids rank okay your skill set as a player how strong is that skill set going to be how much will you be able to impose your will when we play USHL games as a U17 and the group we had the 97s rated themselves a 7.9 I'll be at 7.9 out of 10. My skill will be able to really impact the game. The 95s, I did the survey with when they left the program. So I said, you guys have had two years of experience. Rate your skill the second year in the USHL. They said, well, it was 8.3. The new kids coming in said, they didn't know any of this other data. They said, no, well, we're going to run the league. Then I asked the 95s when they left, they said, okay, what was your skill level when you came in, do you feel? Now that you got the experience, they said five. The average was five, which is probably about right. But it, it, it developed an awareness. Now, I just did these guys. I didn't have the, the data yet, but I did these guys with a survey the other day, before, right before I left. And they all ranked themselves, even though they ranked themselves two years ago, when I come into the USHL, my skill's at 7.9. Now they got the hindsight. They've gone it. They lived it. They put, most of those guys put four or five. So that's how far off. They thought their skill level was going to be a, a, almost an eight. Now that they played in the league and they reflect on it, they're telling me, you know, I was wrong. And my skill level was only a four. And it's interesting data for them, for us as coaches and for them to see. So we, we go over a lot of that stuff with them. I, here's another survey I did with them. And, and this is the survey, actually. So this was just the other day. Uh, I pulled a PDF of it. One of the players rated himself a three, the U17 year, and an eight. So you can see how, how off they were with their mentality when, when we first got them. Um, and I'm going to finish with my favorite term. I think I've come up with a new term, the offenseman. I, I pulled all our defensemen in. Uh, midway through the year and I asked him, I said, you guys have to be honest with me. Do, he, he, I'm trying to help you. Do, do you guys, when you go over the boards for a shift, is the first thing on your mind how to score a point? And they kind of look around at their teammates and I said, please tell me the truth. Every guy raised their hand. Their first objective when they went over the boards was try to score a point. And I had to try to convince them, listen, you got to learn the game. There's no, th th I've never heard of the term offenseman. You're a defenseman. Your success in the future depends on your ability to play your position and know your position. And your offense is going to come after that. It's going to come. You got to build that base. And then the talent that you think you have will rise. 
So it was a challenge, and I challenged him by telling him, hey, you go to the American League if you don't learn how to play defense. Because this guy's a pretty good guy. Won a Norris Trophy, flourishing in the NHL. He spent two years. He, he didn't go to Norfolk in the American League to learn offense. And again, I try to convince the kids through, you know, they, they look up to this guy. They don't look up to me. So I need this, I need this help. So again, that's just another thing we do um, daily. We come up, we think of things like this, and it really helps. We found it helps. So Kenny, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, guys. Any, uh, any questions for Don? Anyone have any questions? Yeah, um, well, well, as I mentioned, I, I post the practice for the guys, so they come in, they're looking at the wall. Um, the, I always have a heart rate drill on there. So the first four or five minutes, something to get their heart rate up. Again, maybe it's a game, maybe it's keep away. Um, one on one, two on two, three on three, keep away in a corner in a small area. Uh, we do a ton of small area stuff, by the way, if I haven't said that already. Um, so I do get, get their going, get their heart rate going, because that gets them into it. Then I go with, with flow. I mean, this is basically coming off the pro stuff. The guys, the guys need flow to get going. So it would be shooting, maybe two quick shooting drills. Um, I name, this is, a, this is something that I just, just um, hit me and I thought it was a great idea to do it is, is um, I don't know if I got it from somebody else or not, but to name the drills after the players. So it speeds up practice. So we'll go, hey, Jack Johnson, we gotta do the Jack Johnson and then Clint Lewis. And the guys band their pucks, and they're they're ready. They're ready to go, and and we tell them, hey, if you do the drill really great, we're gonna name it after you, and they they love it. So we got the Whitey, we got the Wierenski, we got we got Clint Lewis and Jack Johnson, and the, Maddie Hunwick, some of the NHL guys that come and skate with us. We name drills after them too, um, and it, again, it speeds. It gets them engaged in practice too. They see it on the board. Hey, we're doing the Wierenski today. Hey, we're doing the Warren today. You know, and uh, all our drills really are from the video. I've actually got an edit in the thing that's a drill. That so when I see something in the video, and and for me everything's reps, rep, 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 rep. So rep going to the net, rep, you know, shoulder checking. It's got to be reps. So I challenge our coaches with the drills. You know, design a drill where we can get more reps and guys standing in line less. Not a good drill if the guys are standing in line. Like I don't want them in line for too long. You know, they got to go and they got to be tired. We'll give them a break after the drill, but not, not during the drill. Um, so we got the flow to start, two on O's. Then we go a two on O or two on one, and a three on O, or three, and not a three on O, but a three on one or three on two. And then we get into line work. And again, we don't do a lot of systems. We'll do three on twos for the D and for the, for the offense. And we'll do it out of regroups. We'll do it out of breakouts. We'll do it off of, you know, quick four checks or something like that. But it's all drills. And, uh, and so we'll have probably three drills in the middle there. And then we'll finish typically with skill stuff, small area and games. If we go on the next a second session, it's usually 40 minutes of small area games for just straight skill development. I give them the practice, a feel for your line mates, you know, up and down the rink, using guys up and down the rink, entering a zone, coming out of a zone, uh, you know, in reps, and then skill stuff. So, if that answers you. No, um, there's something off ice, everybody, not training every day. Uh, two to three days a week in the weight room, depending on how the schedule is and, and what our strength coach has, Daryl has lined up. But I literally do this. When we, when we take the guys in the U17 year, we give up size, speed, strength. Size, speed, strength. We don't give up skill when we go into the USHL with our team. Size, speed, strength. So I. I, after my first go around with the 95s, and this group here, the 97s I just had, I, I grabbed Daryl and I said, hey, Daryl, there's a blank calendar, uh, September and October. Maximize strength in those two months. I want them as strong as you think you could get them, and then you tell me where they absolutely need rest, and I'll, practice plan, I'll plan practice around that. And it was awesome. It was awesome. It was, it was the right thing to do. Our kids got strength 
and even gained weight right away. Uh, Dave, our, our uh, nutritionist Dave Ellis here and does all our body comp, he's done it for years. I can remember he sent me an email that he hadn't seen growth like that in a team uh, at the program since he'd been there. Um, and it was just, we just said, hey, let's look at it. We're giving up size, speed, and strength. Why am I going out on the ice and trying to run systems when size, speed, and strength is why our kids can't compete yet or the biggest challenge for them competing? So, um, so then we, we, we went heavy then, but yeah. Played on that first team that you were on, and I was wondering what that first uh, miserable team, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, how do you think you changed the most, like you know, from now and then till now? Like what? what yeah, there, there's no question that the, the two most dysfunctional teams I had, and Colin was on one of them, um, and and there was no dysfunction there. He's he was one of the one of the guys that were into it. Um, just taught me how to be better, how to just be better. I mean, you know, our athletes today, you you. You can't be confrontational as a coach. You got to be, you got to be level-headed. You got to be very well planned. You can plan things out very well. Be very well prepared. Uh, you have to have, organize your staff. You know, um, they have to know what your vision and mission is and why you're doing things. Biggest thing is why you're doing things. You know, to me. But I, I learned a lot being in the American League and under fire. You you got to be efficient. I mean, you really. You don't have a lot of practice time. There's one slide on here that I didn't get to that I looked at. I was coaching the Chicago Wolves the whole season, and there was 54 practices that were just des designated practice day. There was nothing else. So 54 practices. Every other day on the calendar, we either played a game the night before or played a game the next night. So if you play the game the next night, you're, it's a pregame skate. You guys are looking at, hey, coach, just 25 minutes. It's all flow. we got a game tomorrow. And if you played the night before, it's like, hey, coach, we played a game last night. So 54 days where I, as a coach, said, okay, these are days that we can work on the ice where the player should be focused. A day rest after a game, and there's no game tomorrow. 54 days. I told you, you can, you can have them for less than an hour on the ice. You got to be special. You got to have your GM threatening them if you're going to keep them on the ice for an hour. So that's 54 hours to try to win a championship. Think about that. A work week is 40 hours. You've got 54 to try to win a championship. So it, it forces you to think and rethink. And you know, the, the biggest thing with coaching to me is efficiency and effectiveness. Those are two things. You've got to be efficient, and you've got to find a way to be effective. Any more questions? Donnie, how much, uh, how much video will you use with this number group? Oh, it's going to be a read and react with this group. You know, I mean, but I would say a lot. And I would say I will show them NHL video. The well, first thing I'll do um, is get a list of who, who their favorite NHL player is. See where their head is, you know. Um, you know, you got... Maybe you got a, a guy five foot six saying that Milan Luchas is his favorite player. You might want to know that, you know. Um, so, so we'll get that. Um, a great thing to do is get their favorite player, Patrick Kane. And, you know, 10 kids will put down Patrick Kane. So then what, what, what we'll do is we'll show the detail in Patrick Kane's game. And we'll show one period of shifts and see how many times he actually tried to dangle a guy. Because in their mind, Patrick Kane, every time he gets the puck, he goes and dangles a guy. So we use it for that purpose. Again, it's, it's amazing effect using NHL players. Because it's less threatening. So I use NHL players all the time. I don't use our guys until our guys do it right, really. They don't need to see themselves do it wrong. That's my, my approach. Rarely do I show them. The, the one lazy back check or whatever, yeah, you're going to see that probably in front of your teammates. But if he just would have dangled through his legs and lost it and recovered, I probably wouldn't have showed it. I wouldn't have showed it. So. Thank you.